Hello, I'm Pastor Hilly. Thank you for joining us for Faith Lutheran Church's Adult Forum series. We're calling this week's episode, Dying, Death, and Mourning During Social Distancing. And before we get to our special guest this week, a brief reminder that during this time of social distancing, there is wonderful ministry coming out of the community that we call Faith Lutheran Church in Whitehall, Ohio. Ministry that includes this very podcast. If you would like to support the ministry of faith financially, please find the link labeled giving in the description below. And now, on to our topic. Joining me today is Dwight Seacrest, who is a funeral director at Evans Funeral Home here in Columbus. Dwight, thank you so much for joining us. Pastor Hilly, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Glad to be here. So uh, how, is, uh, how is this socially distant world treating uh, you personally? Well, um, you know, I have two young children, 10 and 7, and uh, my wife is uh, working from home, and we're fortunate that way. Uh, but she has the challenges of uh, uh, home, basically homeschooling the kids, uh, and it's, it, it can get a little rough out there. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm able to uh, go to work, and my, my personal uh, job has, uh, you know, by being able to go in, hasn't changed too much. Uh, I'm lucky that I'm able to do that, and uh, uh, fortunate to serve families, but uh, for my wife personally, um, it's it's been it's been a definite change and a different way of life. I I hear from friends of mine who have young children, your children's ages and younger, saying that you know it was such a big um, learning curve those first few weeks was getting that family schedule in in the yeah. place. Do you did you find that to be the case yeah. too? Oh gosh, absolutely. Uh, it's it's been a challenge, that's mm. for sure. Um, after uh, and and for us, it's probably taken a little bit longer than two weeks, uh, than a couple of weeks. But we're we're finally there. The kids are uh, the kids are doing well, um, but it is a learning curve, and certainly um, not having a teacher uh, with them, you know during the school day, uh, every day as, um, it's, it's hard. It's hard, yeah. especially when you're trying to do, you know, my wife is trying to do a, a her job from mm -hmm. the home. So with two children uh, in fourth and first grade, it's, it's been a challenge, but, uh, I think we're, we're meeting it. Wonderful. Wonderful. I, I mean, you just made the comment that your kind of daily job at Evans in some ways hasn't changed and I'm sure in some ways it has. The thing that I say to pastors all, uh, who I know in the area and across America is it feels like it's the wild west in terms of what we're doing because the landscape since March 15th or so has been so radically different. How, how about from where you sit? Oh, gosh, absolutely. Um, you know, at the funeral home, uh, you know, talking with families, uh, the, way, the way that we do things has completely changed. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we are allowing 10 people, 10 immediate family members in a room to see their loved ones um, for a viewing. Nothing is public today. Everything is a private, uh, private viewing, private services, uh, and then out to the cemetery. So what we're doing a lot of is we're actually um, having the family come in, have a viewing for an hour, having the service take place after that at the funeral home, and then traveling to the cemetery for a graveside for the committal service. Um, so we're seeing, that's pretty much what we're seeing. Um, now the other, the other thing we're seeing is, is we're having the family come in and they're able to say goodbye to their loved one, uh, in the casket at the funeral home. But then immediately we're going out and having a graveside mm -hmm. service. So it, uh, before we were doing things like four to seven for calling hours one evening, the next day having the service, uh, 
going in procession to the cemetery today, that's not happening. That's that's extremely rare. Right. But but even with uh, with the service at the funeral home, are, are you still mandated by that ten people? Or we are absolutely. Um, now, one thing that we're trying to uh, help families with is that we are allowing 10 people into the room at one time. If they would like to uh, take those 10 people out and bring 10 more in, mm -hmm. we are allowing that. Okay. But we're only allowing 10 people into uh, the viewing uh, area or the, you know into the chapel at one time. Right. Now, are, are there the same rules in place at a graveside committal? I mean, you're outside, but then, I mean, I, I've done plenty of committals. That's a tight space under that tent. Right, right. Um, cemeteries are saying 10 people mm. at the graveside. Uh, they've been pretty, uh, they've been pretty, uh, expectant about that. So yeah. we're doing 10 people at the graveside, 10 at the funeral home. Now what cemeteries are doing to kind of help the families is that they're saying if you have more people coming, they can remain in the car and listen to the oh. middle service or listen to the graveside service. So they're, they're actually putting the tents closer to the road mm -hmm. and allowing uh, people to come up and uh, be able to listen to the service that can't get out of their vehicles. So does that mean that either at the cemetery or you all as a funeral home would have to provide a PA? Or is that up to whoever is doing uh, the, the graveside to just project? We're, we're, we're leaving it up to the uh, person at the graveside, to the minister, to the mm -hmm. family. Um, so far, it's worked. Okay. Uh, have not had any issues with it. Good. Good. Because, yeah, I, I remember I, I heard this heartbreaking story of a woman in Georgia who her son and husband both passed away within five days, uh, both of COVID-19 related uh, symptoms and whatnot. And uh, the story was that the funeral directors drove the two hearses, you know, up the path as close as they could get. And uh, the, the grave diggers were the one who in a stroke of just pure humanity, served as the pallbearers. And yes. the woman had to sit in her car and just watch this happen. And you think about, A, just the, the, the heartache and trauma of loss, then two right. people in your family, and then to feel, I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough to be able to serve people in that moment a lot. And I know that in that moment, people already feel helpless. But then literally to be confined to a car, that just increases oh. that helplessness. Oh, absolutely. Um, what, these, what these families are going through right now is uh, they, they have enough of this uh, stress and uh, mourning going on with the loss of their loved one. And it's, it's doubled, it's tripled by the fact that uh, you know, you can't have um, all of your friends that you want there. You can't have all of the support um, that that we need, that they need. And it's really, uh, it's really difficult for families today to be able to have everyone that you would want out at the grave or out at the funeral home. It's really, um, it's, it's sad. It really is. And you know, we try and express to families that we're doing this because we have to. Yeah. It's not because we want to. Um, and, and, you know, we have to keep it to that certain number of people. And we're asking people to be uh, social distancing at the same time. It's, it's a very, um, it's a very difficult time for, for families. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about families, but before we go too far down that road, I did just have a, a logistical question, which yes. is when, when we talk about, uh, you know, the sad reality that is loss of life, and then, you know, you, 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 there are two paths at, at that point, right? Embalming and burial or cremation. Um, so what does, 
what does it look like in the background of the industry that you're in? As we keep hearing stories about New York, right? And what is it, Rikers Island with the mass, uh, mass burials and that kind of thing? Like, what are we seeing in Columbus? Well, we're fortunate. Um, we have not seen the amount of deaths that were projected. Good. Good. Um, I think at, uh, at our funeral home, at Evan's funeral home, we've had uh, approximately five uh, coronavirus patients um, mm -hmm. deceased come in. Um, so it hasn't been what we had anticipated. And I think that is uh, certainly due to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, the citizens of Columbus have done their due diligence yep. in in social distancing and quarantining. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's a good thing. However, you know, again, we have had those patients and, um, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing, but, uh, but we're, you know, families have been, families have been great about everything. Good. So we're fortunate. Kids, I, I, last summer I was reading a number of memoirs written by people in the funeral home industry. Yes. And they were, they were all just brilliantly written. And, you know, there are so many kind of logistical questions about the, the funeral industry that people never think about. And they should, right? Because that is not their job. But, right. But when, when you think about uh, any time there's a surge in, in um, uh, people passing away, then it's kind of like, you know, uh, 47 people who have passed away who have all been cremated. That takes up a lot less space in the back. That you're absolutely right. Um, we have not seen a surge in cremation, which is interesting. Really? Um, we have seen a surge in uh, the immediate burial with a graveside service. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, uh, we have families come in. They will come in for 20 to 30 minutes. They will uh, identify say goodbye to their loved one and then straight to uh straight to the cemetery for the graveside service uh yeah i've been kind of surprised that the um that the direct cremation uh has not increased that's for sure that is really surprising yes it is it really is hmm. So uh, walk me through, what does it look like to, uh, to plan a funeral or a memorial or a celebration of life during this time of social distancing? Sure. Um, you know, the, the family comes in. Uh, we're only allowing six family members to come into the funeral home um, where we used to meet them in our arrangement office. We're no longer doing that. It's, it's not a... Uh, uh, it's not a big office, so we're going into our chapels to meet with the family so that we can observe that uh, uh, six feet of social distancing. Yeah. Um, once they come in to, uh, into the room, uh, you know, we explain to them, we explain to the family exactly what is happening, what, our, uh, uh, what we're able to do as far as the 10 people in the chapel at one time. Um, everyone, every family has been very uh, knowledgeable and uh, accepting of that fact. So that, that is good. But um, really, once we tell them that, you know, it's 10 people, it's, and, and we, we make mention, you know, that really what everyone is doing is doing this one hour of viewing prior mm -hmm. to the service, having the service, and then going out to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, we have had a lot of people staying outside of the funeral home. Uh, we can do a Zoom uh, meeting. Oh, wow. Or a Zoom uh, a service. Mm -hmm for those people that aren't able to be into the funeral home. Once the service is over and we've had the people inside pay their respects, we have asked those that are outside if they'd like to come in and do the same. So we're, we're doing what we can to ensure that everyone has that opportunity to 
uh, pay their respects and say goodbye to their loved ones. Mm -hmm. um, and families have been very cooperative. So we're very fortunate for that. Has there been any request or is it something that's offered to do a delayed memorial where people kind of set everything up or? Absolutely, we, we totally encourage that. Mm -hmm. um, so many families that aren't able to have um, the number of friends and the number of family that need to be there, that, that they want to be there, we have offered them memorials at a later date, and a lot of them have, have taken that, uh, uh, that suggestion. And uh, we will be having, in the, hopefully here in the, in the summer, uh, in the fall, we will be having um, either graveside, either another graveside service or a memorial service at the funeral home. So they, yeah, families have been very receptive to that. Good. I, I mean, because, you know, I, I find that you're caught in the same tension that so many churches are in and so many other kind of uh, life process vocations where you're, you're stuck between helping people experience life through ritual and looking out for the public safety of the community at large. Exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a fine line, I'll tell you. I, where was it? Uh, it was somewhere, I want to say it was in southwestern Georgia, that in the, there was a county with like 120 cases of COVID-19, and they uh -huh. traced everything back to one uh, graveside uh, funeral. Right. I read that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, it's just this really weird tension where we, we want to be there, we want to be supportive, but we also need to uh, be aware of how our decisions impact one another. Absolutely. So to hear that you're giving those options that look, okay, if we want to do it now, we can do it now. And we can also do this thing later. Right. Right. So yeah, that's very, that's, that, that is something that families are doing. We're doing the 10, 10 immediate family members today and then planning on opening it up in the, in the near future here for, you know, if it's hundreds, wonderful. Right. Um, you know, I've talked to many families that have said, you know what, Dwight, if, um, if we were allowed to have everyone here, we'd have 200 people out here. And I believe them, yeah. you know, I do. And, um, and it's hard for, it's hard for them, but, uh, I think it's also, I think it also helps knowing that later on down the line, we can have that celebration of life and, uh, to continue, uh, that process. Yeah, you know, uh, five weeks ago it was Easter, and I've always been really, uh, really intentional of saying that we do not cancel church. What we do is we postpone live events. Right. And, and I said in the Easter sermon, I go, you know, Easter isn't canceled. It is a celebration delayed. And yes. I, I think that's the case. As we remember, uh, my, uh, a dear friend of mine, her father-in-law passed away in Connecticut very shortly after their shelter and home place. And I remember yeah. talking to her and I go, look, 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 like there will be a celebration. It may just be a celebration delayed because that's the world that we live. That is, that's what's happening right now. Everything is, um, is being delayed and uh, I, it's hard. I, it, I think everyone is ready to, to, you know, get back at it and, um, but, you know, we won't know that. We won't be doing that until uh, we're told we can. Right. And I think that even after we're told that we can, the, um, the reality of feeling safe and feeling secure is an individual kind of bridge cross crossing for right. every person. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> there are people right now who are ready and there are people who no matter what is said, it's going to take 18 months for them to feel comfortable. Definitely. I've, I've spoken with people on the phone that want to make prearrangements, but they don't want to come into the funeral home. Uh, we've done it over the phone. Um, it's, it's a, it's, this is different. And I think that even when this is over, uh, we are going to continue to experience doing things, uh, the way that we have currently. Yeah. Uh, you know, I really believe that. And, it's going to be a new way of, of, of life. 
Mm -hmm. I really do believe that in, in, you know, in certain aspects. You know, I, for a while, everybody was saying, when do we get back to the new normal or to, to normal? And then they right. said, when do we get back to the new normal? New normal. And now I think it's, you know, we just need to figure out what the new is. You know, we need to release ourselves from the idea of whatever we thought normal was. Right. You know, right. right. If we woke up tomorrow and gravity didn't exist, it would take us a while to figure that out. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's where we are. Right. Right. So we're going to tiptoe around a little bit, I think. I think that uh, at the funeral home, you know, we may not see as many uh, elderly coming in uh, to the funeral home. I think we, I think you're definitely going to see, um, you know, I'm a hugger, I'm a handshaker, but I've certainly kind of gotten used to not doing that as much. I think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see, um, uh, families just doing things a little bit differently, uh, as well as, as well as the employees, uh, everywhere, right. no matter what the industry is. How many times a day do you find yourself leaning in for that handshake and then having to pull back? <laughs> uh, probably four or five times. <laughs> yep. And, yep. It's, and it's hard and, and I'll go in for that handshake and the person will kind of go back. I'll go, I am so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just used to it. Yep. Yep. So. So you, uh, you mentioned earlier that at cemeteries, one of the things they're doing is allowing people to drive up and around and roll down the windows and uh, listen in. Yes. You know where I live on the east side in Linden, there's a cemetery right off of uh, 17th. And something that they did that I thought was, at first I didn't understand it, but the more I thought about it, I thought was a, a really kind gesture, was when you're driving down a Woodlawn, um, they put a big tarp over the sign to the cemetery that said, we're open to serve you. Yes. And at first I thought it was really weird, but the more I thought about it, you know, if I did have a loved one who passed away, the first question in my mind would be, oh my gosh, what happens if I can't bury them? Right. And so here was this really kind gesture to let people know. Right. Yeah. So, what else are you seeing at uh, cemeteries across Columbus? You know, um, as, as I say that there are these restrictions in the number of people, I am seeing, and I won't name the cemeteries, right, right. but there are some cemeteries that are, as long as they are socially distancing, they are allowing more than 10. And I... You know, at this point, I think that's that's okay. I think it's responsible. You're outside. Yep. Um, I have seen cemeteries giving masks out to families, um, to so they they can say, "Hey, look, we understand what you all are going through. There may be more than ten people. We want to make you as safe as possible. Uh, as long as you practice that social distancing." Um, we are going to allow you to have maybe 15 people out there. So I, as we're only supposed to have 10, but at the same time, I think that um, cemeteries are willing to um, kind of be there for the families that way. Yeah. A little bit. I mean, I, you know, whatever you want to call it, I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Oh, I and, agree. Um, I agree 100%. Right, right. Uh, the other thing cemeteries are doing is some cemeteries are not, uh, uh, they are not meeting with the families at the cemetery. They're doing it over the phone Ooh. only. Doing it over the phone only. Now, if, if a family member has a plot out at that cemetery, all they may need to do is talk to the cemetery over the phone. Um, and not have to go into the office and make that contact with with the cemetery personnel. Right. So, it, you know, that's good or bad. I don't know. Um, I know that at the funeral home, we're asking again for just six people to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, we're wearing masks. Uh, they're wearing masks. I'll tell you, the families that have been coming into the funeral home 
have, have done their due diligence. They have come in wearing masks, some wear gloves. Um, and I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm kind of proud of the way that, uh, that the families have come in doing that because they understand, you know, if, if with what's going on, they don't, they don't want to catch something. They don't want to catch the coronavirus. They don't want to give it to another family member. Um, we've had some, again, we've had some COVID-19 cases. Um, one, one woman, um, unfortunately gave it to her father. Mm. Um, terrible. You know, she felt so bad, but there's, it's, it's hard. So they come in, they understand what's at stake. So that's been a, that's been a, uh, that's been a good thing. Um, so again, out at the cemeteries that I think they're trying to accommodate the best that they can, yeah. but you know, again, you're getting, um, uh, I think they're getting creative. Yeah. I, and I get, that's that wild West reality that we live in. <laughs> right. You right. Know, and, and it does make sense beyond just the human care and compassion that if you are outdoor at a cemetery and there is plenty of land there, and again, making sure that everyone's safe, like that just seems like the most kind response. Right, to the right. reality at hand. Absolutely, attempting to, to ensure that everybody is able to participate in, in the funeral, for sure. Because, because at the end of the day, our jobs, whether we're talking about the cemetery or you and the fine folks over at Evans or my, what I do or any of the pastors or religious leaders across Columbus or the nation, our job is to help people process their sadness and to work through that. Right. And so, like, I guess that, that that's a, uh, would be a great question for you and I. How do we help people process the loss of their loved ones and their sadness in this socially distant world? It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Um, you know, we're, we're, you just, we have to let them know that we're here for them and uh, anything that we can do. And you call if you need anything and, um, you know, you just, you try and, and be there for, for them. It's, it's definitely different. I mean, people don't want to come in. They would prefer not to have to come into the funeral home. Maybe, you know, they're not able to come into the church. Um, so, you know, we have to make ourselves available for them any other way that we can. Right. I, I remember in seminary, a mentor of mine said that the best time to call a person after the loss of a loved one is two and a half to three weeks. Yeah. Because at that point in time, all, all the initial people, you know, it's after the ser uh, service, it's after the funeral, it's after the committal, it's after, you know, all the leftovers have been eaten. When that depression kind of hits in and there's that feeling of isolation. Yeah, like, absolutely. Everybody's gone. Everyone's kind of left. Um, and it's just, you know, if it's the wife or the daughter or the son, whoever it might be, you know, they finally get that opportunity to exhale. And um, that's kind of when it sinks in sometimes. Right. But, but, so, but now we're living in this world where we don't even, or the, the cultural ritual that get us from A to B have been so drastically changed because now we, we don't have the funeral and all the guests and all that sort of thing. And then the law right. on the other side. So, I mean, I, I think about that chain of events as an overwhelming sense of closure back ended by the reality sinking in. So I, right. what, what could people do who, are looking for that sense of closure. I mean, I mean, are those are those conversations in your industry like what are new rituals for closure that we can put together? You know, I I don't know if 
I'm able to see the family through, uh, through the burial, mm -hmm. through the cremation. Yeah. Um, I may follow up with them to see how they are doing. Uh, but during this time, the closure process, uh, you know, I feel, I, I don't get that opportunity to see that. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's one thing that, um, you know, I can, I can call a family and ask how they're doing and if they need anything. Um, but whether or not they do or they don't, I'm not really privy to that. Yeah. Don't tell me I'm fine, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, you know, as far as the closure, and especially during this, I, I, I feel for the family. I yeah. feel for the loved ones because I don't know if they're getting that closure that they need uh, like they would if this was not going on. Right. And I think that this is some of the really... Uh, I mean, I, myself speaking from a Christian perspective, right? This is the great work that like we do together, you know, that, that between the services you offer and the services and ritual that, that I offer, the church offers in a different way. We're, we're trying to help people through that process. Right. In, in a way that's, I, I mean, always unfamiliar, but it's unfamiliar and alien now. Right. Because right. The is, it is what it is. Yeah, it is. Um, there's, there's no, um, again, there's no blueprint for this. No. You know? So it's, you know, you, you hope that the family, that they have that ability to have that closure. You hope that you know, I tell them, rely on, on your family. Yeah. You know, you guys will get through this. Um, it will hurt. It will, you're going to miss them so much, but with your family, you're going to get through this. Yeah. Um, that's the only thing, you know, I, I try and give words of encouragement, but uh, whether or not that helps, I don't know. Uh, one of my dearest uh, friends and mentor and, and mentors in life once said to me, uh, especially when you're at a funeral, he goes, no one will remember a single word you have ever said. He, he goes, but no one will ever forget the fact that you were there. There you go. And yeah. I think that it's that ministry of presence is what we both do, which is so imperative to, to our vocation. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's hard because, you know, sometimes all a family member needs is a big hug. Yep. And we can't do that. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. sometimes that's all they need. And um, it's hard. It's hard. We can't be there for them that way. Yeah. So you hope that uh, you hope that things for them are, you know, go well. And you hope that they're able to process and have that closure. But during this time, you just don't, you don't know. Yeah. So, so that being said, as, as we look down the road, whether we're looking down the road four weeks when we get into June on the other side of the Stay Safe Ohio order, four yeah. months, which puts us into the beginning of fall or maybe a year, like, I, I don't know, where do, you, where do you see all this going? What do you think our future kind of looks like? Honestly, I think uh, at, at the very least through the summer, I think we're, we're looking at what we're doing right now. Yeah. I don't think things are changing much. Yeah. Um, I think that we are going to continue to have a limited number of people in the funeral homes. Um, I think it's important to open the churches back up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there will be limited number of people allowed in the churches. Yep. Um, and I, I feel that this has changed. I think this has changed the industry quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, uh, we're going to have a lot of people that aren't going to be as, um, 
physical <laughs> as as we used to be, you know, with uh, uh, as far as 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 hugging and and handshakes and things like that. Um, I think that we're in for I think we're in for something that's different. I think we're going to see more of the this one hour prior uh, service. Uh, it's it, it's a new world, I think. Yeah. I really do. I believe that. Do you think that the cemeteries may open, for, for lack of a better word, um, sooner than funeral homes, merely due to the fact that it's outside and that there's a land? I would like to think so. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I can I, see... I can see the graveside committal being the new capstone uh, morning event of remembrance. Sure, absolutely. That that would not surprise me at all if we see that graveside service um, happen so much more. So many families are having the immediate family come in, mm -hmm. identify, view, say goodbye. Yeah. Thirty minutes, and then off to the cemetery. Yeah. And I, I, I believe that. I, I believe that that could definitely be a, uh, a change in the way that things are, are more, um, you know, the new normal or more acceptable. Right. Yeah. And that, that means every, uh, every cemetery owner is going to have to hire an audiovisual guy now. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. I mean, you're gonna, you, we may see that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's important that, um, you know, during this time that, that, uh, especially the elderly, you know, we're not getting as, as many elderly, okay, into the funeral home because of, uh, because they're more susceptible. Uh, so I, I think we're going to see more of them just going out to the graveside or maybe staying in their cars. That could be something that, uh, we see more and more that, uh, that doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting. <laughs> I, 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 th I think the next four to 18 months are, yeah, it's a new world and it will be interesting to figure out how, how the dust settles in so many different ways. Yeah, I, it's, it's, um, it, it, I think the thing is, we don't know how long this is going to last, really. Right. Uh, they're talking about schools uh, next year, maybe going for two days uh you know two days a week and then the rest is homeschooling um it's it's it it's different yeah. i don't know you know it's just there's a big question mark out there and it'll be interesting to see uh what happens and and how how things unfold yeah and well yeah, and I, I'm just thankful as a clergy here in the Columbus metropolitan area that I know that uh, there are funeral directors like yourself and so many of, uh, you know, not only your colleagues there at Evans, but just other wonderful funeral directors across the city that are there to help lead us through this process. So just, Dwight, thank you so much for everything that you do. Oh, my pleasure, Pastor Hilly. I'm glad to be here for you, and I'm glad to talk to you. Yes, sir. Uh, All right. So it's uh, Dwight Seacrest, uh, funeral director at Evans Funeral Home. Thank you again so much for being part of this. And uh, I'm sure our paths will cross again, my friend. I know they will. Thank you, sir. Thank Appreciate you. it. Yes, sir. Bye-bye.